What's up Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to another reaction video to Tiger Rock. We are doing the second story in Tiger Rock today and it has possibly the weirdest name of all of them in probably all of the books. It is called The Monty Within. I'm a little bit scared going into this <laughs> as to what that means and whether or not that's kind of foreshadowing as to something that may happen in the story. But nevertheless, I am very excited to see what this is about. I heard it is kind of like a an average story, like a bog standard, but um, maybe a little bit below average. But we're not going to keep our hopes low or expectations low. I just want to get straight into this and see what the hell the Monty Within means. Let's go. Let's go. The droning bee let out an ear-stabbing screech and grabbed Kane by the shoulders, hauling him from the sleek sailboat that was cutting through calm blue waters under a dazzling blue sky. Kane thrashed, but the bee hung on. Its high-pitched keens uh, drilling through Kane's ear right into his brain. Ugh! Kane kicked at the bee and fell out of bed. The second his shoulder impacted the rough grey Berber rug that did little to soften the hardwood floor under it, Kane realised that the bee wasn't a bee at all. It was his alarm clock. So he was dreaming. Uh, oh, by the way, thank you so much to Cube. Uh, Cube JSAB, I believe I've seen you in my comments before or in my Discord. I don't know. But I recognise your name, so thank you for reading this. Um, cool. Oh, oh yeah, he'd been thinking that if... It wasn't all the way over there. He'd hit the snooze button in his sleep and be late for. Kane blinked and looked at the clock's glowing blue numbers. Oh crap! If he didn't get a move on, he'd be late to pick up Sienna. He'd already been late twice this week, which wasn't winning him any happy girlfriend points. He takes a shower. As the water started to spurt, cold and loud, he remembered that he promised Archer he'd look over his school project before Archer caught the bus. The night before, while Kane had been hunched over his black metal computer desk. Tapping on his laptop keys as he worked on his senior essay draft, his mother had reminded him about his big brother responsibility. Why can't you look at the project? Kane had asked, frowning over a sentence that just wouldn't come out the way he wanted. His mom had sighed so heavily that her spearmint-scented breath had blown Kane's hair down his forehead. What do I know about baseball? she'd asked. Or science? She put a hand on one of uh, Kane's hunched up shoulders. And besides, it's your opinion that matters most to him. Hmm. So much import so much filler that may be important for later and also character building. Oh no, we don't like filler. We don't like filler, especially in these videos. Okay. I'm sorry if this is boring, but we gotta get through it, okay? Uh I'm gonna be skipping actually no, I'm gonna be skipping kind of as much as possible but keeping a little bit of detail that may be important later on. Uh, I'm going to try my best, okay? It's it's kind of difficult to get through this quickly, but also efficiently. So Archer is 13-year-old nerd. Um, yeah, brother. The whole reason Archer had done his science project on the physics of baseball was because Kane was his high school's star hitter. Okay, okay. On top of his great hitting, Kane was an outstanding left fielder. Archer, who can care less about sports but loved science and numbers, thought Kane's stats made him some kind of superhero. Oh, that's kind of cute, actually. That's kind of cute. He's reflecting on the past. Kane ran through the coming day in his mind. After he looked over Archer's project and raced over to pick up Sienna to get them to school, he needed to talk about Miss Rivera, or Mr. Rivera, sorry, his English teacher, about part of his essay. At lunch, Kane hoped to grab some time in the school's wood shop. This year before, he'd signed up for shop class where so he could learn what he needed to know to help his mum with her DIY projects. Hmm. He had a talent for, for woodworking, apparently. He was toying over an extra credit project that was now double as a, as a surprise to Sienna and was grabbing time on it as often as he could. And then he had the date he'd promised Sienna. When Kane got home from his date, Archer inevitably would want to hang out before bedtime. There needs to be two of me, he said out loud. Foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling it foreshadowing. If that is correct, you have to like the video and subscribe. I'm joking. Like the video anyway, because I know that's not going to be correct. How is there going to be two of him? Mm. There's going to be him and the Monty within. Okay. Um, if his essay thesis was right, there were two of him. The problem was that Kane, that 
both Canes shared one body and that limited what he could get done in the day. Okay. Kane, who understood that his dark brown eyes, his magical features, wide mouth, and strong jaw added up to what Sienna called too handsome for your own good, though it only made sense to take care of his looks. Just because he was super busy didn't mean he couldn't have swag. By the way, I'm sorry if you can hear background noise. There is some construction going on outside. I'm going to shut my curtain real quick. That literally doesn't dampen the noise. I am so sorry. I'm going to have to talk louder. There we go. His words echoed in the big glass domed, yeah, big glass doored shower stool, and he laughed. It's his. Wait, I already read that part. I'm so stupid. Is it actually loud? It is quite loud. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, I I also realised you can you can see this. So hello, there's multiple of me. Whoa. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Kane put his elbows on the shiny red laminate to tabletop of the small corner booth he'd managed to snag even though the pizza plex's main dining room was hopping as usual. LED lights wrapping the booth's purple vinyl seats flickered in constant motion creating shadows that played over Sienna's freckled face and lit up her intense blue eyes. The table they shared was so tiny that she was only inches away even though she sat across from him. So the way I see it... <laughs> Continue on the subject uh, that inside of us is kind of like our own Alexa or Siri. All oh, right, so they're talking about kind of like um, inner dialogue and a mind's eye, I guess. Um, well, that's a little bit different, but a non sentient intelligence that acts like an on demand computer, sort of a helper or file keeper, basically managing our lives and running the show. You're talking about the left brain. True. <laughs> right. No, left. You're, you're right, I mean, correct. Oh, that's such a stupid joke to have in. For a moment, he forgot his train of thought. Choo-choo! The only thing he could focus on was how he was head over heels for her. Her dress, the colour of the tangerines that grew on the tree in his family backyard, wasn't fancy, but the way she wore it made Kane feel like he was underdressed in his jeans and dark green polo shirt. But that was normal. Sienna's idea of casual was several rungs above his. Why is it so loud? <laughs> I'm sorry if you can hear it. Um... Sienna usually let her shoulder-length strawberry blonde hair hang free. Tonight she'd gathered it in a tussled updo that dangled tendrils down her high cheekbones. Not usually one for much makeup, she'd made an exception to her rule tonight. So you think our left brain is like a computer, and that means that the right brain is our consciousness. Basically, it's what makes us human. It's our sentient connection with the world and with each other. The gangly, curly-haired server bopped up to their booth and placed a large pepperoni pizza and a salad on the table. The strong scent of garlic wafted from the glistening red pizza sauce. Sienna reached out and snagged the large p slice of pizza. Following the slice, sorry, folding the slice in half lengthwise, she blew away steam rising from the hot pepperoni slices and gooey cheese. Then she took a, a huge bite. Um... Volleyball team. Sienna was on the volleyball team. Um, did you think I forgot what today is? Um, well, you're pretty romantic, but but nothing. One year ago, we had our first date. Wow! At the old Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria? What? So hear me out a second. Oh my god! Wait, no, 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 that's massive! In terms of timeline placement, people have been saying, No, that's massive! That's actually massive that we've heard that. Because that means, right? That means, if they're talking about an old pizzeria, that can only be the pizza place, surely. And so if a year ago was the pizza place, then the pizza place was only built a year after the pizza... What the hell? What? No. Is that a massive lore drop? Am I thinking way too hard about this? So hear me out. They're in the pizza plex. But a year ago, they had a date at the old Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. Old means it was shut down. This is a brain bender. Because like... Because like, surely... Because surely they are, again, 
at that pizzeria, but like, because they would be in the same location. They they would know that they are in the same location as that pizzeria, so maybe it's not. Hmm. Kane nodded and looked around the pizza plexus dining room. This was as close as I could get to recreating that since the pizzeria shut down. It's not Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Place. It might not even be Pizza Place. Yeah, I'm starting to think maybe it's not. I'm starting to think I got excited for no reason. But like, it would be massive implications if it was, because then that would mean that the that the pizza plex opened in 2024. So that's that's really crazy to think about. Anyway, let's go. Kane reached into his pocket and pulled out a flat rectangular box wrapped in gold paper. I was going to wait until after dinner, he said as he set it on the table, but I can't. Which part can't wait? Sienna asked, eyeing the box. Your computer part or your sentient part? I'm not really sure, that's the tough part of my thesis, because our parts usually work together. It's tough to tell which part is running the show. Uh, she opened the box and let out a squeal that turned the heads of nearby diners. Uh, she reached into the box and pulled out a sloth-shaped onyx pendant uh, <laughs> hanging from a black stainless steel chain. This is so cool, Sienna breathed. Uh, I love it. Oh, and that's, that's why... Cube said Slowpoke is for the next quote because it is a sloth. And if you don't understand that reference, then go and read Tiger Rock. Um, <laughs> in spite of being pretty much as busy as he was, or maybe because of that, Sienna loved sloths. She's a sloth collector, collecting all type of sloth collectibles. <laughs> that, that is a weird line, although that isn't in the actual book, okay. Kane finished his senior essay, The AI Within, just in the nick of time. Could this be about Mimic? Could the Monty Within actually be about the Mimic? Okay. He turned it in an hour before the deadline. Now, all he had to do was rework the essay into an oral report that every senior had to give at the senior thesis assembly the following week. The most boring nine pages of your life that you have to cover because it's important for the rest of the story? Okay. Wait, no, I, this doesn't look, this actually doesn't look boring. Okay, one second, he and Sienna had walked hand in hand down the hall on the first day of school year, and the next, Kane was standing behind the scarred wood podium in the school's high-ceilinged uh, cedar wood assembly hall. Kane gripped the podium with both hands and looked out at the rows and rows and rows of burgundy, velvet-coloured uh, seats. Every one of them was occupied by kids and teachers. Hundreds of pairs of eyes stared up for him. Uh, Kane cleared his throat and said, batter up. The audience laughed. When I, Kane pointed at himself, am talking to you, which part of me is talking to you? That question is the focus of my essay. Okay, so I won't throw too many dates at you, because Mrs. Fre Mr. Freeman and Miss Boyd do enough of that. But I will pitch a couple dates. Don't worry, there won't be a test on this when I'm done. In the late 1700s, a guy named Maynard Simon Dupoy I don't know if that's pronounced right, but okay. Said that mankind was homo duplex because he thought humans had a double brain with a double mind. Almost a century later, a guy named Arthur Ladbroke Wigan took that idea further after he watched the autopsy of a man who was missing one hemisphere of his brain but could walk and talk and read and write and do everything he did just like a normal man. That is Phineas Gage, no? Oh, uh, no, I guess he's missing his frontal lobe. But I guess that is like a hemisphere. I don't know. Um, yeah. Kane winked at the audience. He did that before he died, obviously. I want to roll, Kane thought. <laughs> Rock and roll. If you paid any attention at all in biology, I actually really like this part, by the way. This isn't boring. You know that our brains have two hemispheres, cleverly named left brain and right brain. But this guy had been living with just half a brain, and according to the people who'd known him, he acted like pretty much any ordinary guy. So, Wigan concluded that if a guy could function with half a brain, that half, that, that, then half the brain could be one whole mind. That meant that those of us who have both halves have two minds. He called this the duality of the mind. Kind of mind-blowing, right? Fast forward to the last century, Kane said. A Nobel Prize-winning neurologist <sighs> Neuropsychologist and neurobiologist Roger Sperry did a bunch of split brain studies, back then separating the two hemispheres of the brain by cutting through the corpus callosum, the nerve fibers that connect the two sides, was done for medical reasons, to treat epilepsy, and Sperry studied how people functioned when their brains were separated. 
He studied split brains in cats and monkeys too, but that kind of creeps me out, so I'll stick with what he found in the humans. The study results are really strange to think about. I'll tell you about just a couple of them. So Sperry knew that each side of our brains is responsible for the opposite side of our body. This means that your right brain works with the left eye and vice versa. Really? That's, that's strange. I actually didn't know that. He designed his experiments so he could monitor that each eye saw so he could tell what information was going into the brain. Are you with me? Okay, so one of the things Sperry did, this is a big paragraph, was show words to either the split brain person's left eye or to the right eye. He found that the only words split brain people could remember were the ones they saw with their right eye. Interesting. Is this true? I might need to do some research into this. This is really fascinating. If Sperry showed two different objects to a split brain person, one to the left eye, one to the right eye, and then asked them to draw what they saw, the participants could only draw what they saw with the left eye. Right. With the left eye, uh, what the right eye only saw, the people couldn't draw, but they could describe it with words. Because of this, Sperry realised that the left brain is the part that uses language and speech. The right brain can't, on its own, function in that way. And what's really interesting to me is that whatever word or image was shown to the right eye, it was then shown to the left eye. The person acted like they'd never seen the word or image before. In other words, each side of the brain was acting as an individual unit, and the other side of the brain wasn't aware of what its opposite was doing. That means that when the two sides of the brain can communicate with each other, things done side by side, sorry, things done by one side of the brain can be done without the other side of the brain even being aware of it. Sperry did a whole bunch of cool experiments, but I won't bore you with them. The important thing is that Sperry showed that people act differently depending on whether their brain halves are connected or not. Basically, when the brain is separated, people have two independent brains with unique personality traits. Hmm. That's interesting. I always thought that was kind of um, like a pseudoscience. I, I, I guess it's, uh, there is some truth to it, right? How your brain is split in two, essentially, and there's a creative side. Sorry, creative side, and then um, kind of li more literary side. Um, and you know, you always saw like these um, like Buzzfeed quizzes and stuff online that are like, are you more left brained or right brained? And I, I, I think that's a little bit like more of a lie, right? It's like you, you can't really be more of one. Well, like it's kind of hard. I, I don't I, I'm not going to get into science talk because this is a story about it, This is a story called the Monty within. I don't think we need to get much. <laughs> I don't think we need to get very sciencey, but it is interesting. I, if I had a prediction for this story, I reckon Fazbear Entertainment probably have a product or an AR system, not an AR, like a, I guess a VR or, or like a chip. Imagine they had a chip and it was just like Monty talking to you. You're in a dialogue. Um, and he just keeps going, rock and roll. <laughs> hey, little guy. <laughs> anyway, okay. So I'll tell you about one more person who's written about the left right brain stuff. And then I'll tell you what I think and why. In 1996, a neuroanatomist, a neuroanatomist, Jill Bolt Taylor, who was only 37 at the time, had a stroke, which means the blood vessel burst in her brain. In Taylor's case, the vessel was in her left brain. That basically meant that her left brain went offline and what she experienced made it very clear how the right brain acts without left brain and in turn makes it clear how the left brain functions. Taylor, by the recovered from her stroke, it took eight years. Um, she wrote way she wrote away a book about what she learned about her brain and how it works. It's called My Stroke of Insight. And if you ever want to quit messing with your cell phone or stop video gaming, it's worth a read. I might read this. <laughs> I might read it. Because um, that is interesting. That's, that's pretty cool. What Taylor experienced showed Taylor that when the brain is connected and all the neurons are functioning the way they should, it makes us feel like we're having one cohesive experience of the world. We're not aware that there's a right brain perception and a left brain perception. We don't realize that there are basically two parts of us, but there are. And it's also that thing of like, you need, um, you need two eyes for depth perception. It's like stereopsis, I think it's called, or stereopsis. Uh, I, I, I did a bit of psychology actually. I, I did psychology in school and I think it's very fascinating. I think perception is my favorite part of psychology. Um, I didn't really get much into like the left brain, right brain stuff, but I think it's very fascinating that we have like pairs of things uh, and that is for good reason. That is for very good reason and, and it really helps our body to understand things and comprehend things easier. Um, but there you go. Um, 
Anyway, when Taylor's left brain wasn't functioning correctly, she was using a line, blah, blah, blah. I think we can kind of skip a lot of this. Okay, and my internet has gone. <laughs> well, I'll see you again in a second to continue this. Okay, I'm back. It's actually been a few hours since I recorded the first part, so uh, apologies uh, for any inconvenience, but we're going to start from here because this is kind of like, um, this is kind of, I guess, where we were. So, sorry if I've skipped a part out or whatever, but th I don't think this part means that much. I think you ju you're just supposed to get the themes of left brain, right brain. There's two kind of consciousnesses inside your brain, because I feel like it's going to be a kind of, not a golden duo situation, but it's going to be, you know, Monty's in his head or something. Anyway. Sentience means consciousness, and consciousness is basically your awareness of you. It's being clued into your thoughts and feelings and memories and what's going on around you. Kane strolled away from the podium and looked out at his audience. I think of the computer side of our brain as a sort of Alexa or Siri, an artificial intelligence that basically acts as, let's say, the word processing program and the data processing pro program in our mind. It's what keeps us on track so we can get things done. The AI within is what makes us productive. Hmm, the thing is, productive is great and all, but Dr. Taylor's experience shows us that the left brain, um, because basically it is a biological AI that's running programs instead of being present in the world, can cause all sorts of problems. Back to Taylor for a second. She said she noticed that when her left brain was... When her left brain was... I don't know, that, that's grammatically not making sense, but she stopped putting herself down and questioning herself. I'm sure you've all heard of the term negative self-talk. I think that self-talk comes from the computer part of ourselves. Right, okay. Who's talking to whom? Uh, so imagine if the left brain, uh, sorry, imagine if the left brain or what I assume is our AI took over completely. The left brain runs programs based on whatever information it has taken in. What if the information that's gone into your inner computer isn't the best information? He's literally talking about the mimic right now. He is literally writing an essay about the mimic, not actually about the mimic, but we're talking about an AI and we're talking about an AI that takes in information and, um, and runs programs based on that information. Um, and so like, what if your inner computer isn't the best information taker like what if it's not taking the good information what if it's reproducing bad things um so yeah i mean our parents and teachers try but they don't get it right all the time um i think we can my point is that ai, AI can only use what is given and without the balancing force of the right brain it will contort itself all over the place to fit the data that it receives into what it understands this is very topical by the way right now i think so um, even if what if understands it wrong, because of this, it is very possible that many of the behavioral programs that people have is a result of the biological AI using bad data. When the AI has bad data, it can turn into something that is harmful to itself and the systems around it. This is so large. <laughs> Wait, what? Um, if we could get used to the idea that we have within us these two parts that have totally different agendas and functions, we can be more aware that when the computer program starts to lead us off a cliff. Right. This is very, this is very good. Um, when she was recovering from a stroke, basically getting her AI uh, within functioning again, she said she realized that the parts of her that are ones she's not in love with, the stubborn, arrogant, and jealous parts, for instance, are in her left brain. Basically, it's the left brain, the computer part, that makes us act like jerks. There's no question that the AI within does a lot of good. It can help us get dressed in the morning and drive without uh, plowing into people kids at play <laughs> that's funny but the area part of our minds can also be our worst enemy it all comes down to think or beware just saying um okay I, I think it's all a bunch of crap someone called out kane squinted and saw that the speaker was reg the football team's starting quarterback kane thought of reg as a pretty good friend did bro listen why is that reg stand please well, it sounds to me like a kind of video games cause society's problems thing. That's that's actually kind of valid as well. It's like you can't blame an all in AI and stuff like that. Go on. Well, he seems to be saying that what we're exposed to is what goes into the, this computer in our brain and that's what messes us up. It's the same thing that people say about video games. One of the cheerleaders, Candy, stood. I agree with Reg. I mean, Kane was really funny and interesting, and I think he should get a good grade, because he obviously did a lot of research and stuff, but it doesn't make sense to me that there's some computer in our head that makes us do bad stuff. 
con man, she's oversimplifying, Kane thought. Or had he just not explained himself well enough? For the next few minutes, while others weighed in with similar comments, Kane told himself that his feelings were hurt. Wait, his hurt feelings were just his computer reacting from old, old grams. There we go. He looked out at Sienna and watched her toying with her new sloth pendant. That made him feel good, so he did his best to tune out the rest. Hmm. This story is in late May or in early June. That's good to know. That's good to know. Um, oh, it's actually April. March or April. Okay. Cool. Um, all of this was why Kane had to work to suppress a groan when Arch just started bugging Kane to take him to the Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizzaplex. But Arch, Kane said when Archer brought it up in the evening of the essay assembly, we've done everything there is to do in that place. Aren't you bored with it by now? Nuh-uh. <laughs> Archer said as he took a big bite of the tacos Kane made them for dinner. Kane and Archer sat outside um, at the table on the edge of their, their deck. The cushions were bright yellow and red, stripe, and red striped. They reminded Kane a little bit of a circus and also the pizza plex, actually. The evening was warm and still. It was so quiet in the backyard that Kane could hear a bee buzzing around his mum's red geraniums. I want to play air hockey. So can we play air hockey? Why can't Miles go with you? Miles was Archer's one and only friend. It killed Kane that his little brother couldn't seem to make more friends. I like how they have a, like a really close relationship. I think that's really nice. Uh, with something that we don't get much in these stories because of the whole, you know, b b b bully brother dynamic that we get in the FNAF series loads of times. Um, okay, Kane's dad had left five years before. That's good to know. He was a doctor. He'd fallen for his office nurse. Um, his dad was a jerk, though. Okay, she uh, she works long hours, so that's probably why they're so close, the brothers. Um, and Kane and Archer were on their own a lot. So Kane had taught himself to cook. He thought that it was getting pretty good. Uh, Miles went camping with his dad and little sister, Archer said, still crunching his taco. Please, Kane, we can go after dinner. Kane took another bite, inhaling the sharp scent of the lime that he'd added to the meat. That was a good touch, he thought. Sounds quite nice. Um, so far this detail, sorry, so far this story has went into detail about food twice now. <laughs> Maybe there's meaning in that? Um, let's go get an ice cream cone. Okay. You're ready for something very, very cool? I am so ready. Wait, 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 wait. Please, please don't, please don't be a baby. Because they mentioned the circus, and now they're going to get ice cream. <laughs> Kane had been pretty sure that that would work. Archer loved ice cream. Kane and his brother wove their way through the other games. They passed the rows of pinball machines, the racing games, the basketball toss, the shoot 'em up games. Kane passed a life-size plastic version of Roxanne Wolf as he brushed by one of the racing games, and the Blaine ran by, grabbed it, and ran out the door. The corner to head toward the arched opening to the arcade. Okay, but... <laughs> But a flashing orange neon sign brought him to a stop. The sign read, Groundbreaking technology allows you to be your own partner. Kane lifted his gaze to the LED lights flashing above the sign. The lights surrounded a flaming orange arcade game front. Um, curious. Huh. Curious, Kane caught Archer's sleeve. Kane pulled Archer toward the machine. Where are we going? It was called Fazcade Tag Team. I want to check this out, Kane said. A cool, a new game, cool, okay. They walked over to the entrance of a cave-like enclosure that housed eight easy chair-like orange vinyl seats, each paired with a fancy bright yellow joystick. The seats sat in a semicircle in front of a massive, maybe 18 feet by 12 feet concave screen that made up the cave's far wall. The screen's clarity was so amazing that it could have been a window offering a view of a giant cafeteria in which a rowdy food fight between Fazbear Entertainment animatronic characters was ongoing. But of course, neither the cafeteria nor the food fight was real. Kane and Archer stepped under the overhang of the cave's entrance and turned to look at the machine's instruction board. Archer read the glowing neon green words out loud. Remember that essay? Are you ready for a food fight? You and your buddies can team up against you. Wait. Are you ready for a food fight? I, I, like, I don't know what... You're referring to the essay? Wait. I don't know. Are you ready for a food fight? You and your buddies can team up against another group of players on the other side of the pizza plex. Pick your favorite animatronic partner and fight side by side with them. How it works. 
Your favorite fast brain animatronic is in sync with your mind. Control them with your thoughts and intentions. Okay, so here's the bad technology side coming in, right? So is Kane going to just like completely forget about the essay that he wrote? <laughs> Archer looked up at Kane and tugged on Kane's sleeve. I've never been in a food fight, he said. Kane hadn't either, and he didn't think he'd missed anything. But what intrigued him about the game was the idea of working with an AI partner that followed his instructions. It was like a game version of what his essay had been about. He thought it could be a fun way of acting out his theories. Okay, Kane said to Archer, let's try it out. Four of the eight seats in the game were occupied. Kane pointed to two empty seats. Um, <laughs> I completely lost uh, concentration. There we go. Uh, pointed to two empty seats on the on the far left. Archer grinned and dashed to claim the one on the end. As Kane settled into the super comfortable seat, thinking he should get one for his dorm room, Archer fed tokens into the machine. Archer leaned forward and squinted at the small control panel beyond his joystick. It looks like we get to choose which animatronic we want to be, and then they're assigned a partner. Archer tapped on the control panel, and the blue-purple animatronic bunny appeared on the screen. It stood at the end of the, ca end of the cafeteria, away from the food fight action. I'm Bonnie, Archer said. Who do you want to be? No way, uh, no way Bonnie is finally in the books. <laughs> finally, seven books in. Who do you want to be? Kane shrugged. He didn't really care. He just wanted to see how the game worked. Come on, Archer urged. Pick one. Okay, Kane said. This has to be one of the most direct law reveals we've ever had. Orville. Orville was one of the not as well known Fazbear Entertainment characters. Fazbear Entertainment characters. No! <laughs> Wait! What? You're kidding. And now he was in the Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator game. What sort of ramifications does that even have on the law? I guess it could be a Help Wanted 2 thing. It, it very well could be Help Wanted 2. Like, a connection to Help Wanted 2. Hmm. I I'm I'm actually not sure. I don't know how that fits in. So so to get to, to get us all up to speed, right? So FNAF VR Help Wanted was about the previous games in the series, not FNAF 6 and not really Ultimate Custom Night. Um but the previous games in the series and the law of that is that you are playing an actual virtual reality experience in universe uh, and they and, and their aim with this VR series is basically to cover up the past of Fazbear Entertainment. And so FNAF 1 actually happened in the games. Like in, in universe FNAF 1 happened. But also in universe, there is a video game made about those events called FNAF One, so it's kind of like, yeah, you know, you you probably know the Help Wanted law. Anyway, in that in FNAF VR, we don't get any sign of Pizzeria Simulator, probably because Pizzeria Simulator happened. I, I'm not gonna say around the same time as VR, but like, they they won't want to do things about events that are currently happening, right? Um, I guess. So it's strange that we've got, we now hear that there's a Freddy vs. Pizzeria simulator game. Oh, is it? Oh, it's probably talking about this, this, you know, the 8-bit game that we begin with at, in Pizzeria Simulator rather than the entirety of Pizzeria Simulator. I, I don't know though. That's interesting. That mixes things up, especially with like Steve Snodgrass because he made the original FNAF games in FNAF Universe, in the FNAF Universe. So, like, he didn't make Pizzeria Simulator, did he? That's interesting. That's very strange. Okay. Archer giggled as he tapped the keys. 
You're big enough to be an elephant, he told Kane. Kane lifted one arm up in front of his nose and flipped it as if it was a trunk. He made what he thought was a pain of a painable elephant trumpeting sound, which earned him a glare from the black haired girl sitting next to him. Now standing next to Archer's Bonnie was an orange animatronic elephant. The elephant wore a purple top hat and had two black buttons and was and a purple petaled flower on his chest. Looks like just looks just like you, Archer said. He snored and laughed loudly. Kane grinned and reached for the yellow joystick in front of him. He tested the joystick's maneuverability, and once he had the hang of it, he had Orville pick up a bowl of jello from the array of food on the cafeteria's buffet line. Um, Orville tossed it at Bonnie. Hey, Archer said, quickly using his joystick so Bonnie could jump out the way. I'm on your team. Oops, Kane said. <laughs> we do a little trolling. Uh... <laughs> He grinned when Archer elbowed him. Kane looked at the screen and noticed that Bonnie was now accompanied by the Fazbear character Glamrock Chica, a perky white chick in a pink and purple leotard. Orville had been joined by Montgomery Gator, a green alligator with a yellow belly. Literally, not figuratively. Kane hoped he didn't want to go in a food fight with the cowardly gator at his side. Monty had a red mohawk and he wore a pair of star-shaped sunglasses, usually suited up in purple and green armour. This version of Monty had on a purple chef's apron? <laughs> I did not think I would ever hear that. Anyway, Kane was familiar with Monty's character. The gator in Pizza Plex shows was an animatronic band's bassist. He was jolly, mischievous, and the most aggressive of the Fazbear Glamrock characters. It's, it's interesting he points that out. Monty was often roaring and destroying things. He was also pretty egotistical. When he was defeated in a game, he was known to say... What's he going to say? What's he going to say? When he was defeated in a game, he was known to say... I don't know. I only know rock and roll. Or, hey, little guy. How can I lose? I'm so handsome. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Oh, you know what would have been great? If he was wearing an apron in Fury's Rage. That would have been, that would have been so good. As a partner in a food fight, Kane figured Monty would be pretty effective. Are you ready? Archer asked. I'm going in. Kane watched Bonnie and Glamrock Chica charge into the food fight fray. Kane gripped his joystick and he and Monty hurled, hurtled forward. The food fight on the screen had obviously been ongoing for some time and what had originally been a white walled black and white tiled floor cafeteria was now plastered with foods in nearly every colour imaginable. A couple dozen animatronic characters were dodging and weaving between overturned tables and scattered chairs, and another dozen were loading up on food ammo from a buffet line. Kane decided arming Orville was the optimal first move, so doing his best to avoid being pelted by flying spaghetti and sloshed by spurts of thick chocolate milkshake, he had Orville make a beeline for the rows of food. Monty moved in tandem with Orville, as if with one mind. Italics. <laughs> Italics. Um, as they moved on screen, all the characters shouted good-natured threats and let out exclamations of defeat or triumph, depending on the situation. As Monty and Orville headed toward the food, Monty sang out, Party time! <laughs> My impressions are so bad, man. Kane grinned as Orville trumpeted, Let's do this! And Monty responded with, Let's have some fun! At the buffet table, Monty split off from Orville. Orville. Rock and roll! There we go. Monty thundered as he ran. Kane manipulated his joystick so that Orville headed for the fruit bowl at the end of the row. Monty went the other way, snatching up a platter of cupcakes and darting into the fray. Other characters scattered uh, as Monty cried, Run, run, run! Mon uh, Foxy, go, go, go. Uh, Monty's voice was an amusing mix of mischievous teasing and gravelly bass threat. Ooh. Kane left his partner to his cupcake barrage and let himself get totally caught up in the game. And he had a surprisingly great time, leaping, diving, and rolling the same way he did in Outfield. Kane discovered he was sort of a food fight for Nom. Within minutes of joining in the chaotic mess in the virtual cafeteria, Orville had kicked some serious food fight butt. Kane watched the other players, and he picked up on their evasive moves. As a result, Orange... Orville's orange body got a little stained, but he didn't look as messy as most of the other players' characters did. Kane was so caught up in what Orville was doing in the game that he didn't pay too much attention to his alligator partner at first, other than trying to protect Monty when the opposing team tried to squirt the gator with ketchup or pummel him with bread rolls. 
Because the game didn't provide a method of direct communication between team members, Kane figured the best he could do was have Monty's back, and he hoped Monty would have his. As the game progressed though, Kane started to notice that Monty, instead of doing his own thing as Orville was doing, was for the most part mimicking Orville's... Orville's moves. <laughs> it's not mimic, okay. Once he realised what was going on, Kane started studying Monty, and sure enough, he saw that Monty was not only using his moves that were almost identical to, to those of other players, but he was also using some of Orville's moves too. Um... Monty is controlled by Kane's mind, and Kane can see the other player's moves. Right. But it could still be Mimic-related. Right? Because if it is run by the Mimic AI, which it very well could be, because don't forget, we are in the Pizzaplex, which is infected with the Mimic virus. Maybe not, because I don't know where that would be in the timeline. But if we are in the Pizzaplex playing this game, it's possible that Monty has the Mimic 1 virus inside of him, and therefore is seeing things and copying. Um, so it, it's just like whether he breaks like the barrier of the game and starts doing abnormal things, like that's the point where I feel like it could be more mimic um, than actual how it was programmed. Anyway, um, Monty began to use both the unique skills that Kane had brought to the game from his baseball experience and also the new skills that Kane had learned that he played. Interesting, Kane thought. How did that work? Kane moved Orville to a sheltered position behind one of the cafeteria counters. Then Kane took his hand off the joystick and stretched his fingers. He rolled his head on his neck, something he often did on the baseball diamond to make sure he was loose and dialed in to what was going on around him. As his head rotated up, Kane's gaze landed on the game cave's ceiling and he noticed a glowing circle about a foot in diameter above his head. What was that? Get in the game! <laughs> Monty's deep voice called out. Okay, this picture is funny, like, for like two times, and then it's not funny. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, that's my little, that's my little complaint that I always need to do in these live reads. <laughs> no, I, I love, I love, I think this is very well done, but um, yeah, this is like every other second, and I, and I'm not necessarily enjoying it anymore. <laughs> anyway. Um, Kane refocused on the screen. A Glamrock Freddy was trying to sneak up on Orville with a big bowl of oatmeal. Oh no you don't. On the screen, Orville catapulted from behind the counter and leaped over Freddy. Orville's stumpy elephant legs kicked the oatmeal out of Freddy's ga grasp and the elephant used his more than would have been normal for an elephant dexterity to snatch the bowl away from the animatronic bear. He dumped the oatmeal on Freddy's head and then scampered off to rearm himself with more fruit. As Orville went in the direction of the fruit bowl, Kane noticed that Monty was running running alongside Orville. Kane had to send Orville the long way around a tangle of overturned chairs, and as he did, he pondered his next couple of moves. How much fruit should he have Orville try to carry? Should Orville attack or evade next? Kane was concentrating hard on his strategy, so at first he didn't see what Monty was doing. But then he saw that Monty had gone still, as if frozen, on the screen. That's weird, Kane thought. It's because he's now up here, I, I think. I think it's because he's now in his brain. Uh, could be a glitch trap parallel. Well, yeah, glitch trap mimic parallel. There you go. Um, but then a Roxanne wolf came at him with a sloppy bowl of guacamole. His, her partner, the pirate Fox, Foxy, flanked her. He was carrying a big basket of tortilla chips. I ship Foxy and Roxy. <laughs> uh, maybe not. Maybe ship isn't the right word. Or maybe ship is the right word because it's funny wordplay. Anyway, then a Roxanne wolf came at him with a sloppy bowl of guacamole with Foxy. Kane stopped planning. He moved the joystick and sent Orville into action. On the screen, Orville dove behind the tangle of chairs and held one up to block the torrent of chips that were directed his way. Next to him, Monty, roaring fiercely, was back in motion again. Monty shouted, You're in trouble now! as he snatched up a platter from the floor. Using the platter as a shield, Monty advanced on Foxy and, lo and lobbed a bowl of pudding at the fox's head. Fast and loose, Monty bade. With a rumbling, with a rumbling growl, Monty did a little victory dance. Number one victory royale! I'm the man! <laughs> For the next several minutes, Kane's attention was split. That's great. That's that's amazing. I like that. 
Part of him was playing the game, but part of him was analysing Monty's behaviour. It was really intriguing. <coughs> Apologies. Um, as he played and observed, Kane began to see that whenever he concentrated on Orville's actions, trying to plan out his moves and get all strategic about them, Monty would go still, as if glitching. Ooh. So it's kind of like a subconscious, like a, a, per, a peripheral vision kind of thing, I guess. That's kind of sp spooky. Um, when Kane took his hand off the joystick and let Orville go idle, Monty would move freely, mimicking Kane's gameplay. Oh, I see. It was almost like Monty was connected to Kane somehow, even when Kane wasn't using the game control. As he played, Kane frequently glanced up at the glowing golden circle above his head. The light was pulsing a little, its movement was barely noticeable, but the longer Kane play paid attention to it, he realised its fluttering rhythm was irregular. Hmm. Okay. The light shimmer reminded Kane of the often sporadic oscillations of brainwaves. <laughs> yeah, they're not even, like, trying to hide what's happening here. Kane frowned. On the screen in front of him, Orville rotated to look at Monty, who, again, turned to stone. Kane let go of his joystick and craned his neck to look up at the light above his head. What was that thing? Kane felt the muscles in his shoulders tighten as a radical thought popped into his head. He tried to dismiss the thought, but it wouldn't go away. He reviewed what he'd observed in his game. He replayed Monty's moves in his head. He frowned. What if he was right? Um, Kane felt a tug on the sleeve of his shirt. He blinked and looked to his left. Archer. He'd forgotten all about Archer. Our time's up, Archer said. I'm, dis I'm ready for ice cream, okay? Distracted by his thoughts, Kane nodded. Archer jumped up. That was fun, Archer said. Kane nodded again as he rose from his seat. He looked up at the circle above his head. Its light was dimmer now, and it was still. Had it been doing what he thought it had been doing? Um, hmm. Archer, chattering about throwing french fries and getting hit by hum hamburger patties. This is such a... Such a weird, like, utopian story. Uh, led the way out of the Fazcade tag team cave. Kane followed him, but he couldn't stop thinking about what had just happened. However strange it might have sounded if he'd said it out loud, Kane was convinced that the Fazcade tag team game somehow took advantage of the very ideas Kane had researched for his essay. He was sure the game had somehow used his biological AI during the game. The way Monty had behaved really seemed like the game had been hijacking part of Kane's mind. The entire next day, Kane was distracted by the food fight game. His obsession with it made him miss a good half of what he heard in classes and caused him to make two stupid errors doing baseball practice. At least it was a practice and not a game. There's the noise again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Kane realised he had to solve the mental puzzle that was consuming him. He had to go back to the pizza plex and check out the game again. He had to test out his theory. Because Miles and his dad and sister had come back early from their camping trip, something about Miles falling into a bed of poison ivy archer was occupied for the evening. Right. Um, he'd gone over to his friend's house to play Monopoly. Okay. So, Sienna wants a solo sloth evening. Bro, dumper. <laughs> what? Okay. He was free to head back to the Pizza Plex to do a little re... re I thought I said retcon. Recon of the food fight machine. Feeling a little silly walking into the Pizza Plex arcade on his own, Kane did his best to stroll nonchalantly, as if he was super cool, as if he was just a cool senior, senior with a little time to kill. He says he doesn't want to look like a nerd. How could he love his brother and judge nerds at the same time because of the AI within? When Kane ducked into the Fazk tag team player cave, the rest of the arcade sounds diminished just a little. He hadn't noticed that last night. But then, last night, he hadn't been on a mission to figure something out. A mission that made him wish he could get some silence so he could stop and focus. Or, and think. <laughs> only three of the game's orange chairs were occupied, so Kane was able to sit in the end. Not only was it important he sat somewhere else to test his hypothesis, but he was happy for the bit of distance from the three other players. One of them, or maybe all of them, didn't smell so good. It's not very nice. Um, inserting tokens into the machine, Kane leaned forward and studied the control panel. The night before, Archer, who was an arcade game whiz, had called up their personas for the game. Kane had to concentrate to pick Orville again. He wanted to be the same player so he could try to recreate some of the things he'd observed the night before. 
Kane managed to choose Orville, but as the or orange elephant popped into view on the curved screen, Kane suddenly realised he'd have no control over what partner he got. What if... He needn't have worried. Montgomery Gator walked up next to Orville and held out a black clawed hand for a high five. Kane, not trying to be too freaked out by Monty's obvious recognition of Kane, aka Orville, used the joystick so Orville could return the high five. Kane looked up at the golden circle above his head. It was bright again, the same way it had been the, during the game the night before. Okay, Kane muttered. Let's see what happens. For the next 10 minutes, Kane blocked out everything except the food fight playing out on the screen in front of him. While at once doing his best to avoid getting bombarded by food and attempting to score points with well-aimed attacks of his own, Kane carefully observed Monty's behaviour in relation to Kane's strategy and Orville's resulting moves. As had happened the night before, Monty tended to freeze up whenever Kane was overanalyzing, and Monty was in the flow when Kane was. Oh, it's al it's almost like both parts of the brain can't do, like c can only do one thing at a time. Yeah, you know what I mean. Multitasking and stuff. Kane took his hand off the joystick and looked up. The circle of light above his head was flickering just a little. If Kane hadn't been looking for the slight variations in brightness, he didn't think he would have seen them. But there they were. But they were there. Sorry. The light was linked to something that was in turn linked to the game and very probably to Kane. But how did it work? Kane needed to know. Kane jumped to his feet. He looked up at the light, which was still blinking. Were the movements coordinated with Kane's brainwaves, as he suspected? And how had Fazbear synced up to his mind? Kane climbed onto the orange vinyl chair and touched the circle of light. What had looked like just a glow of light from below was clearly a circular heavy plastic panel. It was covering whatever the source, whatever was the source of the light. Oh, I see. Kane tightened his grip on the panel and tend to shift it. Uh, he couldn't do more than wiggle it. He clumped his teeth together the way he did when he was concentrating on catching a long ball, trying to clear the fence, made a fist and pounded on the cover. Sparks shot down from the edges of the plastic like a meteor shower. Kane ducked his head as he heard sizzles around him in the food fight game screen went dark. So did all the lights in the game. Even though the Fazcade tag team game was mostly in its own cave, plenty of light spilled in from the rest of the dazzling arcade. The three kids started shouting accusations at Kane, rightfully so. As Kane approached the game's the game cave's entrance, with the boy shouting accusations behind him, the curly brown-haired attendant stepped around the corner of one of the pinball machines. She looked past Kane and saw the darkened screen. Then she shifted her attention to the boys, who were still pointing and screaming at Kane. The girl frowned at Kane and pressed her lips together. Before she could say anything to him, though, he gave her a short nod and strode away from the food fight game. Tucking his chin, the same way he did after he missed a catch in the game, he kept his eyes on the arcade's bright red carpet as he got out there as quickly as he could. Kane returned home from the pizzaplex just before his mum got home from work. The phone rang as they both walked into the kitchen. Hmm. Kane ran a hand through his hair, which felt limp. That was how he felt too. He couldn't seem to shake off what had happened at the arcade. Kane's mum stood and went to the fridge. Pulling out a bottled protein drink, she opened it and took a big swig as she turned back to Kane. I assume you and Sienna went out. You ate? Kane shook his head. Yes, he said. He blinked. Where in the heck had that come from? He never called himself that before. Oh, a, a liar. He's never called himself a liar before. He'd also never thought that, thought in that taunting tone. And besides, he wasn't lying. Ah, oh, it's because there's something else in your brain, lad. <laughs> uh, and besides, he wasn't lying. He'd answered the question about eating, and he had eaten. He'd stopped by the corner deli and grabbed a turkey sandwich on his way home from the pizza plex. But you didn't go on a date, he thought. Half lie, half lie, half lie. Kane frowned. Reacting to his teasing self-talk, he clarified. I mean, yes, I ate, but no, Sienna and I didn't go out. We, she wanted a sloth evening. She looked at Kane. Are you okay? You look a little... She frowned and studied him. Stressed, I guess. You have some tightness under your eyes there. I'm okay. Just thinking about all the stuff I need to get done. You're full of it, he thought. Rattled and tired, Kane stood and prepared to tell his mum that he was going to turn in early. Instead, he heard himself saying, I'm going out for a run. Whoa! That's a great part. I really like that. That's such a cool element of this story. He's like, okay, I'm going to tell my mum that uh, I'm going to go to sleep. <clears throat> I'm going for a run. Wait, 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 what? I wasn't supposed to say that. Wait, why did I say that? So like, I, I really like that. I think that's really, I think that's sick. 
That's kind of creepy as well. Uh, especially when you put it in bold like this. <laughs> I'm going to turn in after my bath. I'll see you in the morning. Kane's mom stood on her tiptoes. He leaned down for a peck on the cheek. When his mom walked out the room, Kane didn't move. He wasn't sure what to do next. He didn't want to go for a run. Why is he said he was going to go for a run? Run, 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 he thought. For a strange second, Kane felt like doing a little jitterbug step. This feels kind of like, um... Now, don't get me wrong here. This feels a little bit like kids at play. Not for the element that we all know kids at play for. But if you actually read kids at play, like, properly, without memeing about it all the time, you there are some creepy elements in there. Like, the last part is actually very creepy. But the main part is, like, when he breaks the, the toy from the cereal that he gets, the kids at play sign that he gets in his cereal. He breaks it, he goes to sleep. When he wakes up, he cannot move his body. He is paralyzed in his own body, and it's, like, very robotic and, like, a zombie. And that was very creepy to me because not having control of your body is ac actually terrifying. Like, that is one of the most terrifying things for me, I think, is, like, seeing... I I've actually wanted to write a story about this, like, a horror story about, like, I don't know, something taking over your brain and then... Uh, and, and it not doing what you intend to do. And because of that, you witness yourself killing someone or something like that. And it's like really gruesome, but you cannot stop it or something like instead of like turning into a traffic sign, <laughs> I think it'd be really cool if you you see yourself commit crimes, but not being able to do anything with it or something. I think that's really creepy and very scary. Yeah. Um, Kane was used to living in a house that was filled with design trends that popped the almost black stained walnut floors, the gray silk wallpapered walls, the chrome accents in a living room filled with linen covered plush furniture and the modern art and sculptures strategically placed throughout the main living area where uh, were not all what he would call comfy and inviting. But apparently they were chic, ch cheek, chic, there we go, chic, party time, Kane thought as he bounded up the stairs. That sounds like something Monty would say. <laughs> Kane noticed the way he was moving and wondered why he was doing it. He also had the sudden desire to grab one of the framed modern art prints from the wall and throw it down into the foyer. <laughs> Kane suppressed the bizarre, destructive urge. He bolted into his bedroom, where his mom's interior design efforts did not intrude, and he shut the door. Looking at the room that was as familiar to him as his own skin, Kane thought for the first time ever, what's with all the grey in here? I like grey, Kane said out loud. Kane walked to his queen-sized bed and flopped down on it, stretching out he gazed around his room. Lots of grey, he thought, as his gaze circled the large room. Boring, the word stretched out in his head. Boring. I like grey. This is creepy. Kane repeated as if reassuring himself. Reassuring himself. He liked black too. Black and silver were the colours of his favourite major league ba baseball team. Kane had been Archer's aide. Uh, uh, Kane had been Archer's age when he picked out the grey paint for his walls, along with the black uh, painted shaker style headboard and matching dresser, nightstand, chest of drawers and metal credenza style desk. Boring, Kane thought again. What was boring? Um, why did he think that? It had been his idea, for instance, to tackle the subject of his essay. His friends had all picked sports topics, but Kane had thought the workings of the left and right brain were really fascinating and he'd been happy to do the research. Fascinating like a wart, Kane thought. Okay, that's enough, Kane snapped. He sat up and grabbed his head. What was going on with him? It was like something else or someone else was thinking the thoughts in his head. Kane shot to his feet and ran to the bathroom. He uh, stared into the oval mirror above his grey eyes. Grey, rectangular sink. Oh, sorry. His, above his grey, yes, grey, rectangular sink. He looked at himself in the mirror. Um, yeah, fair enough. He notices the tightness under his eyes. While Kane was gazing into the brown eyes that for some reason had a little bit more gold in them than he remembered, he suddenly winked at himself. The wink sent him stumbling back from the sink. I did not just wink at myself, Kane said out loud. Yeah, you did, Kane thought. I'm just tired, Kane said to himself. Yeah, that's it, sport, he thought. Lie, lie, lie. He gets ready to go to bed and wah, wah, baby needs to go to beddy bye. What? <laughs> as he's laying in bed, Monty says, run, run, run again, and Kane falls asleep. He goes to school and the bizarre thoughts, thoughts keep popping up. He goes to a market with Sienna afterwards. Um, it was there when I woke... Oh, wait. 
she had a pimple on the end of her nose and she was self-conscious about it. It was there when I woke up this morning, she'd said to him when he picked her up from us before school. Don't look at it. Can't take my eyes off it, he thought, chuckling inwardly. It's bigger than Chica's cupcake. <laughs> oh my gosh. Shocked not only by the unkind thought, but also by a comparison to a Fazbear character. He tells her it's unnoticeable. Sienna had smiled and given Kane a kiss as he had listened to a long snort in his head. Fast and loose, he'd thought. What a line. So, they find a booth selling seashell animals. It's obvious what Sienna wants. Sloth made of seashells. <laughs> Kane starts getting the money to buy it, but his gaze landed on a kiosk that sold natural skin products. Made from honey and oats and a lot of love, the kiosk sign read. This is terrible. This is awful. Kane, wanting very much to take the sloth from Sienna's hand and buy it, instead nudged Sienna and pointed at the skincare kiosk. You should put back that sloth. No! 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 Oh, this is so funny. This is so funny, but awful. It's tragic. It's so tragic. Oh my gosh. You should put back that sloth. He said, let's go over there and I'll buy you something for the big zit on your nose. Love you, Monty. I'm the man, Kane thought. He had a strong urge to do to grin and do a fist pump. I'm a hoot, he told himself. But what he'd said wasn't funny. It was childish and mean. Why had he said it? That was a bonehead move, young man, the old woman said. Kane heard a roar in his head. Sticks and stones. Rock and roll, he thought. And that was when he realised he had to accept the truth. He tries to apologise to Sienna, but she is not taking it. Let me drive you home, he called. I'd rather get a ride with a serial killer, she shouted. Kane might as well have a sign that read stupid boyfriend above his head. Once he has something to say about Kane thinking this. Not stupid, Kane growled in his head. What would have been stupid was dying the dumb sloth. The skin cream thing was rock and roll. <laughs> This is so funny! This might actually be better than Kids at Play in this aspect. It's so comedic. I love it. He couldn't be with her right now anyways. He was too mind blown. Or actually, he was mind possessed. That was what was going on. He understood now. It, it had happened at the Pizzaplex in the food fight game, game cave. Ugh. He talked about the voice in his head which told him he needed to do stuff like that. He's, his head Alexa. He also was familiar with the tone of his inner voice. He knew what he sounded like in his head. So Kane knew that he was hearing a new voice in his head. His voice was still there some of the time, but another voice had joined it. Kane knew who that voice belonged to. As strange as it sounded, Kane was sure that the new voice in his head belonged to Montgomery Gator. Monty's AI, the food fight game at the pizzeria, had somehow gotten into Kane's neurocircuitry when they were playing the game, and it wasn't leaving. Monty was now a resident in Kane's head. He just hoped he wouldn't be a permanent one. The thoughts sounded just like things Monty had said in the game. Crocs eat sloths for snacks. <laughs> oh my god. That's so funny. Bro somehow got to sleep that night. Uh, the next day, Sienna won't answer his calls. Oh, brother. Bro. He goes to a basketball game, but on the way... So what? Kane thought after he'd left his tenth message and wondered if he still had a girlfriend. Who needs a girlfriend? I do, Kane said out, out loud. Yeah, well, I didn't propose, dude. Kane's buddy Lewis asked. <laughs> this is so funny. Kane elbowed Lewis and tried to look relaxed. I'd accept Frank's proposal before I'd accept yours, Kane said, gesturing at their burly bus driver. I ain't asking either, Frank called out. Uh, he plays basketball for a bit. Stop that, Kane thought. Why in your stance? Get ready to rock and roll. He's going to throw heat. He is not, Kane argued with himself. Actually, he was arguing with Monty. A fastball was coming. Kane's inner Monty thought, and fastballs are fun to hit. Kane knew Monty was wrong about what the picture was going to throw, and who cared what kind of pitch was more fun to hit. Kane needed to make contact with the ball, fun or not. Uh, he had to set up for a knuckleball. In spite of his intention, when Kane stepped back into position at the plate, his arms and legs moved into the fastball-ready position. 
Monty controls his limbs. Oh my gosh. He didn't want them in that position, but that's where they went. He only throws one or two knuckleballs a game, Monty thought. He's already thrown three. No way is he throwing a dumb old knuckleball. They had been ready for a fastball, so of course the knuckleball got past him. Strike three! The umpire shouted with an over-exaggerated fist jab aimed in Kane's direction. Oh, okay. Before Monty had commanded uh, Kane's arms and legs at the basketball game, the only thing Monty had done besides intrude into Kane's thoughts was make Kane suggest a cream for Sienna's pimple. Kane, of course, was nearly unglued by the realisation that he had an AI gator in his head, but he'd rationalised that Monty's thought and the occasional insertion of those thoughts into Kane's speech wasn't the total end of the world. It was bad, yes, very, very bad. And Kane didn't know what he was going to do about it. But he figured he could handle it. For the most part, even though Monty was in his head, Kane was the dominant presence in his mind. Not for long. Not for long, man. After the game, however, Kane had come to grips with the terror of knowing Monty could take over his body at will. He just had to hope that Monty would remain content with a backseat position. <laughs> what is going on down here? Um, he's at lunch at school. Um, the class nerd, Gerald. Okay. Hi, Kane, Gerald said. Kane hadn't trusted himself to open his mouth. Having a nerd for a little brother, Kane had nothing against Gerald. And because other kids were mean to the poor guy, Kane went out of his way to be nice to him. Monty, however, had other ideas. Where do you get that nose? The Kane thought. It looked like someone glued a potato to his face. Uh, Gerald had frowned when Kane didn't speak. Kane had tried to smile, but as he started to stretch his limbs in, into a grin, his tongue attempted to poke its way out. Kane immediately clenched his teeth so his tongue couldn't escape. Monty was trying to stick Kane's tongue out at Gerald. Did you see the meteor shower last night? Gerald asked, hovering near the sinks. <laughs> I love that emoji, man. So funny. Okay. Is that how this little guy got to Earth? Kane thought. He rode down on a meteor? Monty laughs, and Kane nods to Gerald. Cut it out! Kane snapped. Oh, because Monty forces Kane to start cupping water in his hands to throw on Gerald. This is like... This is like Bobby Dots, right? You know how the Bobby Dots were, like, trying to sabotage... Not sabotage, but kill... Um, Abe, right, in, in Bobby Dots, they were trying to kill Abe. It's like that, it's, except it's not like an external thing, it's an internal thing, which is great. I love the, the concept of it. Not you, Kane managed to say over the top of the thought. Cry baby, cry baby. He says he was talking to himself, and Monty says in his head, lie, lie, lie. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even think about it. Uh, oh, ammo for a food fight. Okay, this is, this is kind of, kind of crazy, right? Kane started to choose a green salad from the food in the cafeteria buffet. Uh, when Kane almost used his right hand on the large plate of greens, the hand veered away from the greens and grabbed a bowl of cherry jello. As soon as he grabbed the jello, Kane let go. Uh, the bowl dropped back to the bed of ice it had sat on. Kane attempted to go for the green salad again, but his right hand headed back toward the jello. Frowning, Kane lifted his left hand and got the salad he wanted. At the same time, his right hand grabbed the jello. <laughs> There's so many mentionings of Jello here. Kane put the green salad on his tray and he tried to get his right hand to put uh, There was a hierarchy in high school and Kane was at the top of it. Even when he did something. Um, wait. Did he throw. Okay, whatever. Food fight stuff. Even when he did something weird, kids on the lower rungs of the ladder weren't going to call him on it. You think? He thought. What if you do this? Before he could get himself under control, Kane's right hand flipped the green salad up from his tray, flinging lettuce all over his shirt. As the lettuce scattered, Kane's right hand reached up for a bowl of macaroni salad. Even though he tried to grab the salad with his left hand, Kane's right hand managed to lift the bowl and upturn the salad onto the top of his head. Kane could hear riotous, riotous laughter in his head. Points for me, he thought. Before he could stop himself, Kane picked up the ladle that rested in a big pot of chilli. The ladle, filled with chilli, lifted upward. The spicy scent of jalapeno... or Jalapeno? Well, I've, not, I've actually never said jalapeno before. Jalapeno. And I'm just saying it... I, why do I always say things wrong when I'm on recording? I swear I'm not this bad at speaking in real life. The spicy scent of jal... The spicy scent of jalapeno... Jalapenos... 
jalapeno, jalapeno face. The spicy sense of jalapeno and chili powder. Okay, I'm so terrible at reading. Assaulted Kane's nostrils. Whatever. Kane squinted at his right hand and as and he shot out his left hand to grab the ladle's handle. For several seconds, his right and left hands fought over the ladle. Chili squirted onto his tray and shirt and splattered onto the floor. I win, his thoughts chortled. Kane offers to clean it up, but the lunch lady says she'll do it. Kane's excuse for doing it, a social experiment to see if he could start a food fight. Monty is proud. Oh, he's actually going to become Monty. Oh, give me five, Kane thought. Good one. What about eats? He thought, I'm hungry. Tough, he muttered as he turned and strode out the cafeteria. No way was he going to risk another one-man food fight. At practice that afternoon, Kane took some good-natured ribbing about his social experiment, fighting urges to hawk loogies and kick dirt at his friends. Kane managed to keep up the charade that he'd be throwing around food to see what people would do. To see if I could start a food fight by tossing around little food, Kane said, thinking fast. At yourself? Lewis asked. He was warming up nearby, firing fastballs at Jimmy, the team's catcher. That's pretty tame, if you ask me. Kane shrugged. Yeah, I didn't get to do what I wanted to do. Kane didn't mean to say that. It was Monty. You're no fun at all, Kane thought. Or Monty thought. Um, he goes to the wood shop to work on his gift for Sienna. Kane let the metal doors fall close behind him. Um, 12 feet of spinning metal rollers that carried long pieces of wood. A uh, sheet of plywood lay on the roller. Kane could tell by its sweet, almost wintergreen-like scent that it was birch. Um, okay, his project is a cutting board shaped like a sloth. Okay, that's actually kind of cute. Um, the shop room was shaped like an inverted T. The horizontal part of the upside-down T, extending both ways from the doors, contained the shop's large power tools. The radial arm saws, band saws, table saws, table routers... Uh, the others as well. <laughs> Looking good, Kane thought. He wasn't sure if he was his or Monty's. Oh, that's great. I love how it's blowing the lines between the two now. They're becoming one entity. They're becoming one. Grabbing a cordless jigsaw, Kane positioned the saw's thin blade at the, mid uh, the middle of the sloth's rounded back and he griped, he griped, he gripped the saw's handle with his right hand. Kane moved his thumb, intending to start the saw. Before he could depress the switch, however, he picked up the saw and moved it to the outer edge of the glued together boards. Then Kane's thumb turned on the saw. The saw started cutting zigzags along the edge of the boards, but that wasn't what Kane wanted. He wanted to start uh, next, what? He wanted to start, my gosh, please spell correctly. <laughs> he wanted to start next to the template something. Uh, so he tried to move the saw the right place. The saw wouldn't move. It wouldn't move because his hand wouldn't make him move. Sloths are boring, he thought. A sun would be more fun. Oh, no, you don't, Kane said. They fight over it and shed the board and shred the board to pieces. He's disappointed. How much longer is the story? <laughs> I know it's a 10 pages, but it, this story genuinely feels like it's two hours long. Genuinely, not even kidding. Um, the next morning, Kane woke up 20 minutes before his alarm was set to go off. This was very weird, but no weirder than sharing brain space with an animatronic gator. Get out of bed, sleepyhead. The now all too familiar inner voice sing songed in Kane's head. Let's rock and roll. Kane groaned. He put his pillow over his face, party pooper, he thought. He calls Sienna, goes to voicemail, and begins leaving a voicemail. Uh, I've been saying things I don't mean, and I. Kane managed to get his thumb on the red end call button on his phone just in time, and his mouth finished. Think you're stuck up for getting so bent out of shape about one little comment about your huge zit. Forget her. Let's have some fun, Kane thought. No, not Kane. Monty. This is, uh, uh, this is a cool narrative, to be fair. Um, oh, come on, Kane thought. Get in the game. Offering to buy her cream for a big zit was funny. Kane took a shower, got out, and wrapped a towel around his waist. He stepped over to his sink. Ignoring his wet hair, he reached into the drawing cabinet under the sink. There, he kept his hair products, his razor and his scissors. He grabbed his razor and quickly shaved, and he started to reach for his blow dryer. His right hand froze before he could grab it. Oh no, is he going to cut himself or something? A mohawk would be more fun. Before he could stop it, Kane's right hand went back into the drawer and grabbed his razor again. Kane immediately knocked the razor from his right hand with his left hand. Not the hair, Kane said. He looked at himself in the mirror. Squinting, he leaned forward. I know you're in there, he said. But you're not in command. I am. Against his will, Kane leaned toward the mirror. The right side of his mouth quirked up into a snotty grin. 
You're in trouble now. Kane's right hand shot into the drawer and grabbed the razor again. It lifted the razor and it moved the razor toward the side of his head. The razor was almost touching Kane's hair when his left hand reached up and slapped the razor away. The razor rocketed across the bathroom. Kane again tried to pick up his blow dryer and again his right hand wouldn't cooperate. He rolled his eyes and grabbed the blow dryer with his left hand, thinking he'd won the hair battle. Kane didn't realise what his right hand was doing until a pair of scissors appeared in his field of vision. The scissors opened and headed toward the long waves of hair on top of his head. Hey! Kane shouted. He dropped the blow dryer and lifted his left hand to grab the scissors. As Kane's left hand attempted to wrest the scissors from his right hand, his right hand turned the scissors. It slashed one, pe one blade uh, of the open scissors across Kane's left palm, ultimately driving the point into the meaty part of the palm under Kane's thumb. He goes to the ER and gets stitches. He gets to school after lunch. He thinks Monty's gone. It's a miracle! After practice, Kane starts to head towards the car. His hand was throbbing. All he wanted to do was go home, lie down and forget the last few days. So why was he walking down the hallway in the opposite direction from the parking lot? I love that. Kane was so distracted by the pain in his hand and the euphoria of thinking his problem was over that he was halfway down the beige tiled locker lined hallway before he realised that his feet were taking him someplace his consciousness had no intention of going. And soon as he caught on to what was happening, Kane tried to stop his feet, but his feet kept going. Monty wasn't gone after all. Monty was the one taking Kane to the school's shop. Kane pushed open the double doors to the shop. It was empty. Why are we here? Kane asked, moving forward without any desire to do so. Monty remained silent. Kane turned and walked toward the self-feeding table saw. Frowning, he reached the end of it and he levered himself up so he was seated on the plywood that still lay on the metal rollers. What are you doing? Kane heard the panic that tinged his words. Kane concentrated and tried to push, push himself off the plywood. Instead of lifting him up and away from the saw, one of his hands gripped the plywood and the other reached out and flipped the switch to the power on the saw. A high-pitched whine filled the room and the saw blade buzzed into motion. The metallic screeching roar filled Kane's head. The saw sound, though, wasn't loud enough. Silence. Kane's no, Monty thoughts. Um, Monty's thoughts. Ugh. I've tried to play along with you, but you're no fun. You need to go away. What do you mean? Kane shouted. Con concentrating on regaining control of his muscles, Kane grunted with the strain of attempting to push himself off that, the, that expanse of birch. But again, his body did the opposite of what he wanted. He lay back on the plywood. As soon as Kane was in the prone position, the plywood started to move along the metal rollers. Kane was able... Uh, Kane, able to control his head just enough to crane his neck to the side, looked back at the saw's huge spinning blade. The saw's shrill keen filled his head as his heart began to pound as fast as the saw was whirring. whirling. Stop! Kane screamed. The plywood kept moving toward the saw. It carried Kane with it. No! Kane screeched as his head moved closer and closer to the saw blade. Kane strained to keep his gaze on the whirring metal, jagged egg edged disc. He could see that the saw was positioned so it would cut through the centre of his head if he couldn't get control of his body and get off the plywood. If he remained where he was, the saw blade would slice right through the crown and bisect his skull, severing his corpus callosum. I love that. Sawing him in two. Quite literally. That's really cool. The saw's going to cut my brain apart, Kane thought. And the rest of me too. Kane felt the blade cut into his skin. He howled as the saw buzzed relentlessly, preparing to carve into Kane's skull. His thoughts... A chaos of pain and horror. Kane could do nothing to save himself. The table shook violently as the saw struck bone. Rock and roll. <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's the funniest ending ever. That's so funny. The teachers, when they enter the workshop and see half of Kane, the other half run away. Imagine. Uh... Apparently, bleeding heart is insanity. Okay. We will get onto that soon. Wow. That was an entertaining story, to say the least, I think. Um, well, okay, actually. Actually, I'll go back on that. I'll say half of it was entertaining. I think it was quite slow. And again, I don't know if it, it's because, like, most of it was quotes. And it's not your fault, really, because, like, there's no good way to do it, really. Um, because... 
it's a it's a story in a in a book. You 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 need to read the full story to get the full context and stuff. So I, I you've done an amazing job of live reading that, but like um, it did feel a bit slow, and even when I could tell it was picking up, it felt like a little just like drawn out. I feel like it needed, I feel like it needed to do the first parts faster, and then it needed to have there needed to be more like ramifications or no like it, it needed to hmm it's it's difficult then there needs there needs to be more kind of consequences of monty's actions that get progressively worse i think that would have been a really good way to do it i guess there was that but i don't know it, it went from like him losing his girlfriend to him getting sliced in half like i feel like those that's pretty pretty big jump but i don't know I think that was pretty good. I think I really like the concept. I, I understand why people might not like this one as much as the others. I think it's I think it's pretty bog, bog standard. I think it's a really cool idea and I think it was done okay, right? So that's that's where I stand with it, I think. In terms of uh, law, I love I love the word ramifications today. I love the law ramifications of it. Or I don't love the law ramifications of it. I mean, there weren't many law ramifications for it, I don't think. Um, I think could be Mimic related, but it, Mimic was only really a thing at the first half of this story. This story just feels insane. I feel like if this was in Fazbear Frights, everybody would have gone crazy. Like, everybody went crazy for He Told Me Everything. and Or maybe not, actually. I don't know. It's it's such a strange story. Just the Monty within. Why Monty? <laughs> I love it though. Uh, maybe because he's the he's the aggressive one. That's his whole personality trait and stuff. But yeah, I think this is really good. I I think it was really good. I just think a bit slow. Um, so yeah, that was my reading of the Monty within or the live reading of Monty within. Uh, if you didn't know already. Uh, I know this is probably a bad place to say it, but all of my audiobooks are now going to be going on my second channel. So go and subscribe to my second channel, uh, and it's called Ozone Plus. <laughs> I think that's a great name for it. Anyway, that's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, so much for watching. Next time we are going to be reading Bleeding Heart, and I, I think I'm going to do it tomorrow. But I'm very, very excited for this one because apparently it is just insane and apparently there is a content warning but i'll go through that tomorrow anyway thank you guys so much for watching and i'll see you then goodbye <laughs>